Good morning, everyone. I was going to have you see what's on the screen, but techno te technology-wise, I can't do that because I can't record on my iPad and show you what's on the screen at the same time. Eventually, the, that will turn off. If that doesn't turn off by the time I'm done, then there's something wrong. So we'll, we'll do that. So um, this Sunday coming up is the third Sunday after the Epiphany of our Lord. And um, in our readings, we're going we're gonna to read from a book that we, it's the only time we read from that book through our three-year series. Um, and then we're going to continue on with the book of, uh, in Luke. Um, and then go back to 1 Corinthians as we work through that as well. But let's start out with um, uh, our Old Testament reading from Nehemiah chapter 8. This is the only time in the three-year series, so over three years, we read from the book of Nehemiah. This is the only time that we read from the book of Nehemiah. So when I buy a commentary on Nehemiah, it's for this Sunday coming up, you know. And I have a couple commentaries on Nehemiah, which would beg the question, why do I need all these commentaries? Because I like books. And I want more books in my library. I don't know. But Nehemiah, now what do we know about Nehemiah? Well, he's the shortest man in the Old Testament because he's knee high. Maya. He's knee high. Nehemiah is only knee high. He's the shortest man in the Old Testament. But, um, <laughs> All right, no. Who's Nehemiah? Nehemiah, uh, and this is um, the children of Israel have been carried off into captivity in Babylon, um, and some of them are starting to come back to, uh, to the promised land, to Israel, and word is traveling back to the people in Babylon that it's not good in Israel, not good in Jerusalem. The temple is destroyed, city gates and walls are down, it's all destroyed. And Nehemiah um, served... Um, the king in uh, Babylon, uh, he was the uh, cupbearer or the food taster, one of those, one of those positions. And uh, uh, the beginning of Nehemiah, he went in and he had a very sad face and the king asked him, why are you so sad? And, and Nehemiah said, oh, I don't want to tell you. He said, no, no, you can tell me, whatever, we're friends, you can tell me. And he said um, that uh, word is coming back that Jerusalem is just in, in rubble and and. We, and I want to go back, and I want to start to rebuild it. Um, and so uh, the king lets him do that. And he, he says, in fact, not only am I going to let you do that, but I'm going to send money so that you can buy supplies, so that you can make this happen. I'm going to give you a letter saying this is what this is okay, because I'm the king. So Nehemiah goes back, and in a very short period of time, he rebuilds the city walls, and they begin to build, rebuild the temple. Um, and while he's there, there's a guy named Ezra who comes back with him who is a priest. He's a, a Levite priest, a scribe. He's a teacher. He is the teacher. He is the priest um, uh, during this time. And so Nehemiah as the governor and Ezra as the priest, religious leader, if you want to call him pastor, um, they, uh, they get the city rebuilt. And then in chapter 8, they want to start to read from the book of the law, meaning the first five books of the Old Testament. So this is what's happening, that these people have not heard uh, the word of the Lord for many, many years. And so they're all gathered around, and they're, and they're going to start to read from the Old Testament. And, and, uh, and let's just listen to what happens here. All the people gathered as one man in the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read, it, uh, read from it facing the square before the water gate, and early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So they're listening, and they're standing. And how many books in the old, how, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, and Deuteronomy. I mean, it would be more than 20 minutes to read through this. They're, they're, they, you know, if you, were to, if you were to open a Bible app and you were to listen through the first five books, it would be a couple hours. And so they're, they're going to listen. And... Verse 5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, 
and as he opened it, all the people stood. There you go. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. So in other words, Ezra would teach, and they would explain what, what Ezra just read. So think about it. In the beginning, you know, God created the heavens and the earth, and they would probably have a little commentary on that. And then they would get to Exodus and start reading the, the law, the Ten Commandments, and, and then the story of, of how the children of Israel you know, rebelled against God in, in the wilderness. But yet God brought them into the promised land and Deuteronomy and all that kind of stuff. So they're listening to all this, and, and the priests, as you're going to hear this, Nehemiah and Ezra and the other Lev Levitical priests are teaching the people what this means. So verse 9, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the Lord. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has not, nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Which would beg the question, why were they weeping and crying after hearing the word of the Lord? What ye think ye that of that? What might be some possible reasons why they are? Because they haven't been living that way they should. Exactly. They, they went, oh, this is what the Lord wants us to be doing. And they're, they're hearing the law. They go, oh. But then Nehemiah comes and says, stop weeping. This is a feast. This is a celebration. Go eat the fat. Drink the sweetest wine. Have a wonderful time. In other words, hear what the Lord has done for you. You know, already in Genesis 1 and 2, God created everything, put everything together. He, you know, saves Noah and his family, eight souls and all. You have all these stories of how God saved his people. Yes, the law comes, and the law should convict, and we should be going, oh, no, we have not measured up. But we also hear the gospel, the good news of God's salvation. And that's where Nehemiah comes into play here, where he says, this is good. I want you to celebrate. Yes, you're emphasizing, oh, how we have failed, but more importantly, hear what God has done for you and continues to do for you and how he will send a Savior. And that Savior, we find out, will be Jesus. And, and, that's, and for that as well. So you have this, you know, they mourn and they weep, and yet Nehemiah says, rejoice, be glad. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. And that's why we, as a united and growing family of Christians, we are joyfully dedicated to furthering God's kingdom. That wonderful little phrase, joyfully. That's what we do. We're joyful because of what the Lord has done for us and continues to do for us. Just like Nehemiah says, be joyful. Remember, Nehemiah, shortest man in the Old Testament. Because he was only Nehemiah. All right, questions on that? All right, let's jump over to the gospel reading in Luke chapter 4. Now, um, we, last week we had Jesus turning the water into wine, so this is, that's his first miracle. And, and that was in, in, in uh, Cana. And now he's going to go back home to Nazareth, his hometown. So he's going back to, to Nazareth. And, um, you know, word is traveling fast about this Jesus and what he's doing. He's performing miracles. People are starting to follow him. This little hick town, Nazareth, is going to have, a, you know, a, a, a popular star. People are going to, they're going to want to come to Nazareth, see, you know, where did this Jesus live? You know, where, kind of things like that. So, Jesus, is, verse 16, came to Nazareth, where he was brought up, and was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. So, what did Jesus do every week? Go to church. He went to church. Went to church. This was his custom. He did that. Did that as a kid. Did that as an adult. So he goes to the synagogue. In the synagogue were 
places where they would gather together. They would not perform sacrifices there. The sacrifices were done at the temple in Jerusalem. But this synagogue worship goes back to uh, when they were in Babylon and they wanted to gather together as worship and they would form these synagogues. And it was just a group of people gathered together like a church. And so he would go there and he would read. So he was there. Now, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has set me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that's from Isaiah chapter 61. Um, in those words. Now, Jesus tweaks it a little bit. He doesn't quote everything from Isaiah 61, and he kind of changes some things around. But this whole thing is they liked what they heard because what they heard was, um, you know, they're, they're going to get the good news. They're going to hear that they will be, um, they're going to receive uh, freedom. They will not be captives anymore. Uh, the blind will see those who are uh, oppressed will have freedom, liberty, and uh, the, the proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, which was every, every seven years in the Old Testament, every seventh year, the, you were not to plant, you were to rest the land. And then every seventh, seventh year, so every 49th year, um, you would do that, and then you would forgive debts. So if, if you owed someone money, they were to forgive your debt. Or if you had owed somebody, you would be forgiven the debt. So either you are forgiving or you're being forgiven. And so everybody was looking forward to that because that was how God says, okay, we're going to you know, make this happen. Now, it's very interesting that the 49th year, there would have been two years in a row where they would not plant anything. So this was really God's way of telling them, you need to trust me. Now, you can go in and, and harvest whatever's there, but don't plant on purpose. So they would, they would have to two years in a row when they got to this. Um, and so they're, they're saying, oh, yes, God, the Lord is going to provide. This is a wonderful thing. And so they're hearing what they're saying. Hometown boy is making good. He's proclaiming these wonderful words. Good things are going to happen. And then he rolls up the scroll, and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Jesus preaches while he's sitting down. I might try that this week. I don't know if I can do that. I, I don't know if I can do that. I mean, I just, that, I don't know how he did that. But, that's, but sitting down and teaching were very common. You, you hear that other places during that time. So, uh, and all the eyes in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he says to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So, are you listening? Are you hearing what I said? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. So Jesus is going to proclaim your good news to the poor. He's going to proclaim freedom, liberty to the captives. He's going to give sight to the blind, free those who are oppressed, and all debts are going to be forgiven. Now, what Jesus means by that, and what the people think they understand, what Jesus said, are two different things. Because when Jesus says, I'm going to pro proclaim the good news to the poor, what is he talking about? What is the good news? Salvation. Yeah, God's salvation has come. Not, I'm going to forgive you all your debts, your physical debts. You know, I, I'm going to give sight to the blind. It doesn't mean physical blindness, but spiritual blindness they, that they can see. And this whole year of the Lord's favor, that the, that the Lord is going to forgive them their debts, forgive them their sins. And so he says that. And then verse 22, and all spoke well of him. And they marveled at his gracious words that were coming out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? Wait a minute. Who does Jesus think he is? They're starting to go, wait a minute. Okay, you can say that. Oh, that's wonderful words. But wait a minute. We know your dad. We know you. You used to be your little, you know, Jeshua that used to run around with our, our kids. You, you know, you used to work with your dad. You used to, you know, Joseph's son. Huh. Not saying 
because they didn't know that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary because of the Holy Spirit. I mean, they looked at Jesus and they go, oh, we know Joseph. So obviously you're not who you think you are, Jesus. So why are you saying this? But those are gracious words, Jesus. That's very wonderful. But who do you think you are? I mean, they're asking the question. And then Jesus um, says to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. In other words, um, prove it. <laughs> prove that you are the one, Jesus. You know, when, you know, back in the old days, when a doctor would come and say, you know, I can heal you, and he's all sick and decrepit, you know, they're going to go, why would we want to come to you when you can't even heal yourself, you know? So they're, they're going to start to ask questions because they're going to say, do what you did in Capernaum. Do here in your hometown as well. But what miracle have we heard so far in the region of Capernaum? What did Jesus do in Cana? Water, water and wine. wine. Oh, wow. And it was not just a little wine. It was a lot of wine. We're also reading that Jesus is not performing miracles up here. So they're going, well, come do that here, Jesus. We want to see a show. Show us, Jesus, that you're the one. And verse 24 says, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath, in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. Now, remember that story? What was that all about? I'll tell you. Um, king Ahab, bad King Ahab is king of Israel. And God said to Elijah that I'm going to send a famine for at least three and a half years. Um, and, um, and it gets worse in in, in First, Elijah goes to this little valley and he drinks from the stream that comes and then the ravens were bringing him food and then the stream dried up and the bird stopped and God says, I want you to go all the way north up here, outside of Israel, not even in the promised land. And, and I want you to go to Zarephath and I want you to go to this widow who's not a believer. She's not even part of the kingdom not even part of the family of God. I want you to go all the way up there. And if you remember what Elijah told her, she was walking down and he says, make me some bread. And she says, this is it. I'm going to make this. I'm going to feed it to my son. I'm going to feed it to me. And we're going to die. And Elijah says, if you feed that to me, you will have bread and oil every day. And so she did. And she did. She had it. So when Jesus says that Elijah didn't even go to the children of Israel. They went way up. He went way up north to the children who are not descendants of Abraham. So that would have perked up their ears and saying, wait a minute, so are you telling us this whole kingdom of God is not just for us? It's for other people as well? So their, their, their ears are going to perk up. And then Jesus, just to crank it up some more, says, ah, and there were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Remember that story? The children of Israel were carried off into captivity by the Assyrians. By the Syrians. Assyria, Assyria, Assyria. And uh, there was a servant girl who was serving in the house of Naaman. Naaman had leprosy. Naaman tried to do everything he could to get rid of the leprosy. And she says to him, you need to go see the prophet. He'll take care of it. And he goes, blah, blah, blah. and his wife says, well, what do you got to lose? Why don't you go see the prophet? Meaning Elisha. So he travels, and he gets to Elisha's house, and Elisha doesn't come out. He says one of his servants, and he says, tell Naaman to go wash himself in the Maumee River. <laughs> river Damascus. And Naaman's going, Really? He doesn't even come out? I mean, does he know who I am? I'm a great general. I, I mean, I'm people, 
I'm in charge of a lot of people, and he tells me to go swim in that dirty river over there? I could have went did this at home. And his servants go, why don't you just do it? Just see what happens. And Elijah, Elisha says, go do it seven times. And so he does it. And he comes out, and his skin is as clean as it can be, like a baby skin. Well, what's the difference between a baby skin and your skin and my skin right now? Which is more softer? Which is more baby? So this was very soft, you know, wonderful little skin. And so he's healed. He's healed. Elisha doesn't even, but he's not even one of the children of God. He's not even part of the, part of the nation. And yet Elisha heals him, but he doesn't heal some of the descendants of Abraham. Verse 28, when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him off the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. So, they're angry. So, angry so much that they want to do what to Jesus? Kill him. Kill him. Now, it's very interesting, early on in Luke's gospel, he's setting us up as to who the Messiah is. Yes, the Messiah is going to do these things, proclaiming good news, going to heal those who are sick, going to raise the dead. He's going to do all that, but it's not just that. There's going to be rejection that will go along with that as well. So, you know, in hearing God's word, you know, what are you listening to? You have, like in the Old Testament, those who went, oh, no, but they didn't hear the good news. They didn't hear seeing Jesus, oh, here's the Messiah that, that is to come, that was promised from long ago, that, that the Spirit of the Lord would be upon him and that he would proclaim good news and liberty and bring healing and all that stuff with there because in their eyes, the Messiah would come and bring what kind of deliverance? Worldly. Yeah, that, they, that the kingdom of David would be reestablished and that they, then they would be the world power and Jesus, that's not what, that's not why God came. And as we continue to read through the book of Luke and during the season of Epiphany, as it's being revealed to us, we're going to hear about Jesus, the suffering servant, and how he's going to be rejected. And, and obviously the greatest rejection will happen on Good Friday when he goes through that, but yet he will rise again on the third day um, in that. So you, we're beginning to see, oh, you have Messiah that does these wonderful things. Oh, wait a minute, but there's rejection going on as well. So that's part of the messianic uh, prophecy that Jesus is fulfilling. So what are you listening to? You know, we can read through the scriptures, and many times I do this. I look for all the good stuff. <laughs> Great words of comfort and hope. Nothing wrong with that. But I also know that in order, because I'm praying for that comfort and hope, which probably means I'm going through my trials and tribulations, that I'm being rejected, because I'm a follower of Christ. And so that goes hand in hand. Yes, Jesus says, they, they're going to reject you because they rejected me. Don't go, ooh, woe is me. I'm with you. I've been there. I know how it goes. We'll, we will be together through this. And it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And so we, we have that. All right? Questions? Yes? So in, uh, when Jesus was going out, Nobody knew that he was Mary's virgin birth. They just saw him as Joseph. Correct. Because that. Mary never said anything. I, would you want to say anything? I mean, if you would go, oh, I'm, I'm the, I was a virgin when I gave birth to Jesus. What would people think of you? Crazy. <laughs> I mean, that was. I mean, how many virgin births were there up to that point? So, that I think that was. That's why later on, when Jesus continues his ministry, they're asking, are you the Messiah? Um, Jesus is going to, you know, I think Luke writes where he's born. He's born in Bethlehem, the fulfillment of Micah chapter 5. That he, that's, that's what would happen. So there, you're beginning to see as we go through this, the Gospels and how Jesus is the fulfillment of that because, you know, for they just think he's, his hometown is Nazareth. I mean, they, all they know is that's where Jesus grew up. I mean, that's, you know, that's what it is. You know, I've been here in the Fort Wayne area almost 30 years. 
I've been here longer in my life than any other part of my life. But I'm originally from where? From Detroit. And when I tell that people, people go, oh. I said, well, it wasn't as bad when I was there. It's not pleasant there now, but, you know, things like that. I mean, that's just kind of, you know, yes. And my, part of my family still lives in the Detroit area, so um, we have that. Yes? What a difficult life Joseph must have had with knowing that he was not the father. Right. Well, at least not the biological father. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. He, he kind of in the background. Because this is about the last time we will hear about Joseph. I mean, this is kind of the last reference in Jesus' life. So, and we're not sure if Joseph is still alive here or not. Um, because he kind of gets lost. I mean, tradition has it that he dies somewhere between the Jesus' age of 12 and when he starts his earthly ministry. Um, and, and so we have that. Because there will be other times where Mary and Jesus' brothers and sisters show up, but there's no reference to Joseph. So that's, you know, but you, you sit there and you go, well, what would it be like to raise the very Son of God? Yeah. That, you know. Well, you keep hearing the mother of, of Jesus, you know, right. a lot. Mm -hmm. And poor Joseph. Yep. Yeah. But he's a, he's a saint. He's got his own day. I mean, yeah. I mean, th that's quite the role he takes on in saying, okay, I'm the earthly father of, and Understanding that Jesus, yes, he's God, but he's truly human, so he has to go through all the learning stuff that we all go through, you know, and and learning all that and and you know experiencing all those different things that we experience in life. And Joseph was the dad to help him through that, you know, and teaching him that. So kind of interesting. I don't think. I always wonder what I would have done if I had been there and heard him say that. I mean, would I have thought he was the God? Right. I mean, you can understand yes. why they question. Right. Yeah, especially when they in in the temple when he's twelve, going, yeah. Why, why did you do this to us? And he's going, well, where else would I be? i be. I'm in my father's house doing my father's business. And they're probably going, oh. I wonder if they had to do every once in a while. Oh yes, because you get so. Wrapped up in the everyday. Right, you're so used to you're going, huh, you know. And I, and I wonder how many times Jesus' brothers and sisters said, who do you think you are, God? <laughs> and Jesus would go, well, <laughs> mm, yeah. sort of, kind of. Two things. First of all, did this widow in Zarephath have a name? She did not have a name. Okay. She was just known as the widow in Zarephath, which is kind of interesting. I, um, you read the book. You read that book by the Fox News person. Was that one of the characters in the book that she talks about the women in the Bible? And I'm trying to remember if that was one of them. But there's no. She has no name. So she's a no name woman. So let's just go through this. She's not Jewish. Strike one. She she is a widow. Strike two. And she's living outside of the, the promised land. Strike three. I mean, if they're going, she, from the children of Israel eyes, she's a nobody. And yet, who does Elijah go, or Elijah go to? There's nobody. Nobody so much that we don't even know her name. And I think that's on purpose. I think it's on purpose to say that, you know, that God even goes to those no-name people and he does great and wonderful things. That's comforting. Very comforting. And saying, you know, you, know, you, you, you have that. Just like um, in John chapter 3 of Nicodemus, Pharisee, Sanhedrin, ruling council. You go to John chapter 4, you have the woman at the well. What's her name? The woman at the well. That's her name. We don't know anymore. She is, you know, half-breed. I mean, she's a Samaritan. So she's not even technically... She's worse than, than the Gentiles because she has partial Jewish blood, but not. But she's all messed up, 
Yet Jesus has this conversation with her, and she comes to faith, and she goes and tells others. So you do have these no-name people that, you know, I look forward to meeting in heaven and say, now what is your name, really? <laughs> Just curious. I, I want to know your name. So kind of okay. interesting. Yes? All right. <clears throat> Jesus was not... The beginning of his ministry was when he was baptized, right? Correct. And how soon after that did he go to Cana? Do you know? Well, let's put it this. And we kind of, in the church here, we jump out of order. The, you have the baptism, and then he's, then he's tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. Because of the, how the church here, we'll hear about the temptation in Lent 1. Um, so you have, you know, the baptism... He's driven into the wilderness and tempted there. And then, I don't think it's that much more time after the temptation that Jesus is going to end up at Cana in, in, in doing the, doing, starting to do his miracles. I don't think there's that much time. First of his signs. First of his signs that John records. So I assume that this is not, not the next week. <laughs> no. No, we often we kind of oh that was and it might be a couple weeks, might be a month, might be a. Now, we could figure out because he's handed, like us, where you come to church, we have assigned a readings each Sunday. They did that in the Old Testament in the synagogue worship. They had assigned readings for every Sabbath day, and so he gives. Jesus is given the 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 scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he looks for. We would say Isaiah 61, they didn't have chapter and verses back then, but he looks it up and he begins to read it, and he sits down and he begins to teach on it, which means that liturgically speaking, that might have been the assigned reading for that Sabbath day. Now, we could figure out what day that was in the Old Testament, and at one time I remember what it is, but I don't remember now. But it was an assigned, you know, it was assigned for that, like this Sunday coming up, an Epiphany 3 C, we have the reading from Nehemiah and from Luke chapter 4, and then we'll get to 1 Corinthians 12 slash 13. We'll get to 13. So, so there would have been... That's what's going on. So, 